back or being here for the first time. Uh, <clears throat> so unlike last time, I restarted my computer before and it spent 20 minutes updating so we didn't have to wait 20 minutes to start. But. All right, so um, this talk is a continuation of what I talked about last time. And so uh, thankfully for me, Mike uh, reviewed a number of things that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, I'd like to talk about some things that came up in Mike's talk, but also uh, some things that are a little bit orthogonal. All right, so uh, I was interested in this splitting problem, and so let me just remind you what that splitting problem was. Uh, there's this conjecture of uh, Pablo Manmurti from 1997, and if you have a smooth affine variety of dimension d plus one over an algebraically closed field, uh, and you have a rank d vector bundle, so of rank one less than the dimension of the variety, then this bundle will split off a free rank one sum and if and only if its top churn class vanishes. So I sketched last time an approach using obstruction theory to analyzing this kind of question. So because of the affine representability theorem, uh, if I want to understand vector bundles on affine varieties, I can turn that into a homotopy problem. And, uh, then if I want to understand when I have a splitting like this, I could turn that into a lifting problem. Um, and those homotopical lifting problems can be solved, for example, by means of the Postikoff tower. Uh, and so what I wanted to do then was uh, compute the obstructions that arise in the Postikoff tower. And as Mike mentioned in his talk, the things that arise are gonna be things like homotopy sheaves of uh, some of the spaces uh, that we're considering, for example, punctured affine space. Um, and those homotopy sheaves are hard to compute. Uh, and much of what I'd like to say today is basically techniques for describing those homotopy sheaves in an explicit enough way that we can actually understand obstructions. So that's the sense in which this talk will be sort of orthogonal to Mike's talk. All right, so uh, this is the conjecture. And this conjecture is true over an arbitrary algebra, or the, this conjecture is made over an arbitrary algebraically closed field. Um, and building on work of myself and Jean Fazel, uh, Tom and Mike and I established this theorem, at least if K has characteristic zero. Um, I'll also, in the course of discussing this, talk about the work with Jean uh, and discuss sort of lower rank uh, cases and maybe say something about the characteristic hypothesis as well. All right, so that's my goal. Um, so what I sketched last time was that under these dimension hypotheses, there were two obstructions. So, <clears throat> um, so like I said, we turn this into a homotopical lifting problem. And uh, there's a primary obstruction which lives in this sheaf. Uh, so, so this sheaf cohomology group. Um, HD of X with coefficients in this pi D minus one. And of course, already there's a typo. The minus zero should be inside the parentheses. The minus zero inside. That's what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'll discuss this primary obstruction in gory detail in a moment. And assuming that primary obstruction vanishes, then there's a secondary obstruction which lives in this twisted sheaf. And this gives me my second typo, which is that there should also be not only that minus zero should be inside the parentheses, but there should also be a twist by the determinant. So, sorry, two typos on the first slide. It's not a good start. Let's hope things improve. All right, so um, this sheaf was, this first non-vanishing homotopy sheaf of AD minus zero is computed by Fabien. Um, uh, I think maybe Joseph might describe this computation. Uh, this is like a really fantastic computation. And uh, one of the most amazing things that arises in this is that we get the sheaf K Milner with D, which now we've seen a, a few times, uh, but miraculously sort of quadratic forms uh, appear out of the ether. All right. so. I want to compute this primary obstruction, and so what I want to do is first consider the universal case. So uh, the classifying space for the general linear group uh, in this particular rank is the Grassmannian, and I can just compute the sheaf cohomology group. 
So this is some twisted Chow Wit group, which we heard about last week a fair bit. And what's amazing is that it's a K Milner Wit zero module of rank one, and it's generated by the Euler class of the universal bundle of rank D. All right. So we get this primary Euler class obstruction, uh, and it lives in HD of X in this twisted sheaf. <coughs> And we'd like to describe that. So this Euler class is a priori something that has quadratic data in it. Uh, I said it's in some sort of twisted chow wit group. And in Morthy's conjecture, I only mention the top churn class. So I need to be able to compare the Euler class and the top churn class. So the way to do that is by means of some natural exact sequence, which relates chow wit groups and chow groups. And that natural exact sequence comes from uh, a presentation of the milner wit k theory which uh, was written down as a fiber product last week. Uh, I'm gonna use this exact sequence that arises from the fiber product, which is that if I look at the milner witt uh, K-theory sheaf in degree D, if I kill eta, then I get exactly the Milner K-theory sheaf in degree D, and the kernel of that is something that's purely quadratic form data. It's the uh, D plus first power of the fundamental ideal in the Witt ring. All right. And if you're uncomfortable with these twists, you can just ignore them. I'm just, they're there just to be complete, but um, the point is that there's an exact sequence like this. All right, so I can look at that universal case, and I can look at the Euler class, and if I compute the corresponding Chow group, then this is one of the basic computations which defines the top churn class. If I compute HD of the GRD with coefficients K Milner D, that's a free rank one Z module generated by the top churn class, the, the churn class CD. And so if you just look at the universal case, this map will send generators to generators, and so I, the Euler class is necessarily sent to the top churn class. All right, so that tells me that there is some relationship between the Euler class and the top churn class, but what it doesn't tell me is that if the top churn class vanishes, then that's sufficient to guarantee that the Euler class vanishes. But it also tells me how to control the kernel and co-kernel of the map from um, chow wit groups to chow groups, so to understand the difference between the Euler class and the top turn class. And I need to compute some cohomology of these i to the, I to the j sheaves. All right. OK, so we can just understand these sheaves once we know that they're described in terms of quadratic forms. If I have something of dimension d plus one over an algebraically closed field, uh, and I look at this i to the j sheaf, then it's just the zero sheaf as long as j is bigger than or equal to d plus one. And this is a consequence of a result of Arison and Pfister. Uh, so one of the deep facts about these homotopy sheaves that Fabian proved is that they're unramified. And in particular, that means that to understand the sheaf, I can analyze what happens over the generic points of smooth varieties. And uh, in this case, this dimension hypothesis allows me to say that, well, in these ranges, that fundamental ideal is just going to be zero. All right, so that gives us our first simplification. Uh, that'll allow us to con control part of the cohomology. Now, I'm going to be interested in i to the d. Uh, and so if I look at i to the d of uh, twisted by the determinant, then once I know that the d plus first sheaf vanishes, then uh, this quotient coincides with uh, the i to the d sheaf itself. And again, modulo a typo. Oh man, this is awful. I'm so sorry. Um, so this index here is not correct. This should be a d, and so should this. I get uh, the Milner, I get mod two Milner K theory, um, and so this is relying on the resolution of the Milner conjecture on quadratic forms by Orlov, Vishik, and Vavodsky, and also on the, the Milner conjecture on the mod two norm residue homomorphism. So Vavodsky and Ross theorem. Okay, so I, I now want to compute that cohomology, and the idea is to use the block Oga spectral sequence. Once I know that I have a relationship between this i to the d sheaf and something that's involving mod two Milner K theory, then, uh, or mod two et al. cohomology, then I can run the block Oga spectral sequence 
Uh, and what is that? Well, that's the spectral sequence whose E2 page is HI of X with coefficients in these atoll cohomology sheaves, and it converges to the atoll cohomology of X. And so just analyzing that spectral sequence, I get a surjection from the 2D plus first atoll cohomology of X uh, onto the sheaf cohomology group that I'm interested in. And assuming X is affine, well, one of the things you learn is either from uh, the Lefschetz theorem in complex geometry or the Art and Grothendieck vanishing theorem, if you have an affine variety over an algebraic closed field, then the atoll cohomology vanishes in degrees above the dimension. So in particular, this 2D plus first cohomology is necessarily going to vanish, and so we'll get vanishing of this sheaf modulo all of the indexing issues that I tried to mention. So again, sorry about that. All right, so this, is, this kind of analysis is what's going to happen over and over again. We're going to have some sheaf, and because of Fabian's results, uh, you have some nice tools for computing with these sheaves. And then the question is, can I have an explicit enough description to, to, uh, to actually use the resolutions we get to compute? All right, any questions so far? All right, so at the end of the day, this tells me that the groups that control the kernel and co-kernel of the map from Chow-Witt groups to Chow groups, at least in this case where I'm of dimension d plus 1 over an algebraically closed field, are both going to vanish. So in fact, the Chow-Witt group and the Chow group coincide, and we already observed that they send the Euler class to the top churn class. So if the top churn class vanishes, then the Euler class vanishes also. All right. So in the end, we conclude that, in fact, this chow wit group is a Chow group, and uh, vanishing of the top turn class is enough to guarantee vanishing of the primary obstruction. All right, so that's just the first step, and we've already used all of the Milner conjectures um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, uh, you know, things are going to get, we're going to use more tools as we move forward. All right, so that's the primary obstruction, and we understand that. Okay, so now I'd like to motivate the secondary obstruction. And in order to do that, I need to do a little bit of geometry first. So I'm going to start with this Cartesian square of algebraic groups. So I look at uh, a special linear group of size 2n, and I look at the symplectic group of size 2n. And the symplectic group uh, of size 2n embeds in the special linear group by just forgetting that you're preserving a symplectic form. And you can choose... Uh, a volume form of dimension 2n minus 1 such that the intersection of those two groups, equivalent the fiber product, is just sp 2n minus 2. So once you have a Cartesian square like this, you can take the quotients in both directions and compare them. So if I take the quotients horizontally, I get sp 2n mod sp 2n minus 2 or sl 2n mod sl 2n minus 1, and those are necessarily isomorphic. All right. Now, what is SL2n mod SL2n minus 1? Well, that's a quadric of dimension 2n minus 1. Uh, sorry, of dimension, yeah, 2n minus 1. It's a hyperbolic quadric. And up to homotopy, if I just project my element of SL2n onto its first row, that gives me a map to A2n minus the origin, and that map is an isomorphism. So up to homotopy, I conclude that taking quotients horizontally, I get a2n minus the origin in the homotopy category. Yeah? It's because it's what I'll need. Yeah. I could take SL2n minus 2, but then that wouldn't help me later. So. <clears throat> All right. I can also do this vertically and if I take quotients vertically, then I see that SL2n minus 1 mod SP2n minus 2 is isomorphic to SL2n mod SP2n. All right? All right, so this is just fun bits of uh, geometry of classical groups going back, I don't know, as far as you can go. But let me observe that when, well, SL2 is SP2, which is up to homotopy A2 minus the origin. And SL4 mod SP4, by means of these identifications, well, that's SL3 mod SL2, which I just said is uh, 
a n minus the origin, so that's a three minus the origin. So we get these sort of low dimensional exceptional identifications. So what I'd like to do is analyze both of those spaces by stabling, stabilizing. So if I look at sp2, I can sit it inside sp4 and then go on to the stable symplectic group. And likewise, if I look at SL4 mod SP4, then I can sit that inside GL4 mod SP4 and then stabilize that with respect to natural inclusions and eventually get to GL mod SP. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, if you look at those spaces over there, uh, they might be familiar. Those are spaces that appear in bot periodicity for the orthogonal group. All right, so these are just the first two cases of uh, something which I'll come back to later and we'll do more generally. All right, so in algebraic geometry, the same thing is true. If I look at Z times the classifying space of the symplectic group that represents symplectic K theory, uh, it's a result of uh, Marco Schlisting and Girja Tripathi. And I can compute by means of connectivity estimates and uh, what I described before that pi i of sp2 to pi i of sp, which is bsp, well, on pi 1, that map is actually an isomorphism. So on the left-hand side, we have Fabian's computation of pi 1 of a2 minus the origin as milner with k2. And on the right-hand side, if I compute pi 1 of the stable symplectic group, I get symplectic k2. And uh, it's a theorem of Suslin where he basically describes symplectic K2 in sort of generators relations uh, in a way which looked identical to milner with K theory. And so this stabilization fact, which just comes by analyzing connectivity and using Fabian's theorem is sort of a, a reincarnation of, uh, of Sussman's computation. That's right, it's pi two of BSP. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so I'll come back to this more in a second, but again, with the connectivity estimates, uh, we'll see that we actually get a surjection from pi two of A2 minus the origin to symplectic K3. All right. So if I look at these stabilization fiber sequences for the inclusions of sp2 and uh, sp infinity, then what I get is some exact sequence for pi2 of a2 minus the origin. So remember, the secondary obstruction that I was interested in was going to be in pi d of a d minus the origin. Uh, and so in this first interesting case, I get an exact sequence where I get a surjection from pi2 of a2 minus the origin onto ksp3. And if you just track the exact sequence further to the left, there's some map from symplectic K4 to milner witt K4, which covers the co-kernel. And you can analyze this by going back to this sort of classical result of Borel and Serre. Uh, so if I'm interested in the inclusion of SP2 and SP4, uh, Borel and Serre understood homotopy of this sequence in sort of low degrees. And so you can compare this uh, computation of Borel and Serre with algebraic geometry, and this is basically what uh, we do, uh, and you get an explicit description of this co-kernel. And I'm going to put this in quotes because it's not exactly right, but it's sort of morally right. Um, this co-kernel is basically K Milner 4 mod 12 uh, with some additional contribution from the fourth power of the fundamental ideal. And where does that 12 come from? The 12 comes from Borel Serre. All right, so this is a relatively explicit description of this homotopy sheaf. And the reason for that is that we understand something about, say, the symplectic K-theory sheaves. And after Fabian's work, we understand a fair bit about computing with these kinds of co-kernels of this kind of business. We have some nice resolution of this. And it won't matter that this number is precisely 12, but uh, we'll see. It will give us some intuition for where things come from later. All right, so this was the case of A2 minus the origin. You can probably guess what I'm going to do next. Hmm. I don't know why that's looped up. All right, well, so GL mod SP represents another space in uh, Hermitian K theory. 
And I should say, when I'm doing all this stuff using Hermitian K theory, uh, in these kinds of representability statements, uh, so far I should probably assume that, that uh, I'm working over a field of characteristic not two. I'm not exactly sure to what extent uh, the geometric statements work if I don't avoid characteristic two. So let me just leave it at that. Thank you. All right, so this GL mod SP has the property that it's 2-1 loop space is the classical symplectic group, and this was also observed by uh, Kirja and, and Marco. All right, so we can play the same game. We can do these sort of connectivity estimates for SL4 mod SP4, and uh, at least for I bigger than equal to 2, the, the GM that's the difference between SL and GL isn't going to matter. Um, so we get some computations here. So in the bottom degree, if you just sit down and understand what the, the, the numbers are, and again, I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, you see that pi 2 of A3 minus the origin, as described by Fabian's theorem, is Milner with K3. Uh, this gets identified with the appropriate homotopy sheaf of GL mod SP, and this has another name. It's called sometimes GW33. Um, one of the annoying things about the subject is that everyone has their own favorite notation for Hermitian K theory, and everyone seems to use different notation. Um, so this is Marco Schlichting's notation. Um, if you want to use KO notation, then there's a slightly different uh, indexing convention, and it might not look like this. So, all right. So, nevertheless, this is some analog of this computation of Sislin, where I have a nice generators and relations description of something which is a higher growth and weak sheaf. And for the same connectivity reasons, we get some exact sequence which describes the next homotopy of A3 minus the origin. Namely, it gets a surjection onto GW upper 3, lower 4. So I won't say too much about this because it's not going to matter in the end, but this notation for GW, well, there's an upper index and a lower index. The lower index is the degree. The upper index is sort of where you are in the periodicity tower. So it's four periodic. If there's a 2 in the upper index, that's a symplectic thing. If there's a zero, that's the orthogonal thing. And if there's a one and a three, it's the weird things. These Karubi U and V groups in that old notation. All right. All right, so again, if you look at the stabilizations that we were had, then we get some sort of fiber sequence, which looks very similar to what we had before. You get some extension of GW34 by some co-kernel of some map. And Again, you can describe what that is. Uh, it's K Milner 5 mod 24, uh, fiber product with the fifth power of the fundamental ideal. And before we had a 12, and that was because we were sort of unstable, we're still sort of unstable, and that's why this i to the fifth is going to be present. But this pi 3 is now going to have uh, a mod 24 in it, which is coming from the Hopf map, new. All right, so again, this is not literally speaking true, but it's morally true. This is a, I think this is a, a nice way to package the, the statement of the result. All right, so again, we can understand what those homotopy look like. So this, this was where we were in 2013 or so. Uh, Jean and I sort of worked out these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, we went and talked to Fabian, and he said, well, here's a conjecture for what the stable homotopy should look like. And I said, oh, it looks a little bit like this computation, so maybe there's some relationship. OK, so where are we now? We've computed pi 2 of a2 minus the origin and pi 3 of a3 minus the origin. Why did I do that? Um, last time, I mentioned something about stabilization, and these are the two unstable cases. So I wanted to just have those in there for completeness. But now I want to understand what happens under stabilization. All right, so what happens for n bigger than or equal to 4? Well, as was mentioned in Mike's talk, I mean, and as I said last time, uh, the notion of stable range and topology comes from Freudenthal's suspension theorem. If I have an n minus 1 connected point at space, then the fiber of the unit map to the loops in the suspension has some connectivity, uh, and it's 2n minus 1. And in particular, that tells you something about how homotopy behaves. And as I mentioned, that if you do this in the motivic category for S1 suspension, then you get an exact, I mean, there's an exact analog of the Freudenthal theorem, and this was uh, worked out by Fabian in his book, um, A1 Algebraic Topology Over a Field. <clears throat> and we were interested in, 
a n minus the origin, and so we need to understand what happens under p1 suspension. And what I mentioned last time that Freudenthal suspension is just false for p1 suspension. You can just compute the a1 homotopy of, say, the constant Sn, so the topological n sphere, and you can just you'll get the integers. And if you compute the nth homotopy of the p1 loops on the p1 suspension of that, then you don't get the integers anymore. You get Milner with k naught. All right. So we've computed pi two, we've computed pi three of a a three minus the origin, and what we'd like to do is get some information about the higher homotopy of a n minus the origin. And in order to do that, we'd like some analog of the Freudenthal suspension theorem, but we have to take into account this failure of the suspension theorem for things like the topological n sphere. All right. So if you stop paying attention because you got too annoyed by homotopy of the symplectic group, then come back and we're going to talk about something different for a little while. All right, so what I'd like to do is introduce some terminology and some results which are going to help us to uh, eliminate this sort of falsity of the Freudenthal suspension theorem. All right, so intuitively speaking, this topological n-sphere is not GM connected. And so what I'd like to do is introduce some notion of connectivity, which will take into account the fact that in motivic homotopy theory, we have two circles. All right. So I want you to remember that if I look at the collection of n minus 1 connected spaces, then this is built up in some natural way. It's the smallest class of spaces which contains the n-sphere and then is closed up by taking homotopy co-limits and then allowing myself homotopy cofiber extensions. So in other words, if I have a cofiber sequence A to B to C, where A and C are n minus 1 connected, then so is B. So I'm going to take this definition, and I'm going to just transport it into algebraic geometry. So this idea goes back to Dror, um, who studied these notions of cellular classes. Um, and so we're going to make the same definition in the motivic category. So I'm going to introduce this notion of a space lying in O of SPQ. And uh, this is supposed to make you think of sort of error and uh, we'd like to talk about fibers and cofibers of maps and say that they sort of lie in O of SPQ to intend that we have some control over the, somehow, the error in how far a map is from being a weak equivalence by describing these kinds of things. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take my PQ spheres, and they're more sort of basic motivic objects, namely smooth schemes, so my basic cells are not going to just be spheres. They're going to be uh, motivic spheres smashed with smooth schemes. So I'm going to take SPQ smash X plus, where X runs over all the smooth schemes. And I'm going to close this up under co-limits and cofiber extensions. So what I'd like to do now for a little while is sort of analyze this notion of cellularity and I'd like to revisit those computations that I did in the beginning with cellularity in mind. So one of the reasons we like this notation a lot is that there's always these minus ones that appear in connectivity estimates. And whether you want to talk about connective things or connected things, and it's very easy to get confused. Uh, so we'll just keep track of a space. But let me just observe that if I have a space that lies in O of SPQ, uh, then it's P minus Q minus 1 connected. Okay, so it's homotopy sheaves vanish up until that degree. Sorry? Yeah, 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 right. So whenever I just talk about connectivity in this sense, I'm only talking about in the topological direction. But this is the last, I hope, that I'll say this. All right, so just by definition, a n minus the origin lies in O of s 2 n minus 1 n. So Okay, great. Uh, so now we're going to build up sort of a calculus for these cellular classes. If I have a fiber sequence and F and B are in O of SPQ, uh, then E is in O of SPQ, uh, there's going to be connectivity hypotheses, like my spaces are supposed to be connected throughout. Um, so I'm going to drop those just for the interest of exposition. But <coughs> um, all right. So 
I want to revisit that computation I did before where I mentioned these stabilization fiber sequences and I got some sort of connectivity estimates and these gave rise to some exact sequences. I'd like to refine those statements to cellular estimates. So I have this map from BSP2 to BSP, which comes from stabilization, and uh, its fiber is SP mod SP2, and I claim that that fiber is in O of S74. All right. How do we see that? Well, SP mod SP2 is a co-limit of finite dimensional things, SP2N mod SP2, and those finite dimensional things fit into fiber sequences where the target is a sphere. And so now just by induction and these properties, I conclude this fact, right? So now we have not only some sort of connectivity estimate on the fiber of this map, but we also have some additional information which tells us about the GM connectivity, if you will, of the fiber. All right. If I have a space which lies in O of SPQ and P minus Q is bigger than or equal to zero, so that space is connected, um, then I can form the James construction. So this is the basically free pointed monoid on X, and that turns out to model the loops on the suspension of X in the simplicial direction. Uh, and one of the things you know about the James construction is that it has an increasing filtration where the successive subquotients are smash products of X, and if you start with a space that's in O of SPQ, then its smash products will also be in SPQ, and then you can deduce from the cofiber extension property that J of X is also in O of SPQ as well. All right. So uh, this fact that the James model works in motivic homotopy theory, I learned from Fabien. He wrote something about this in like 2004, but never wrote it up, and then uh, we wrote it up with uh, ben Williams and, and Kirsten, uh, and uh, there's a better approach to this now by Peter Hain and, um, uh, and Sana, David of Brooklyn. All right, so we can also analog analyze the cellular class of the fiber from SL4 mod SP4 to SL mod SP, and we're going to do this in exactly the same way, and this is where that 2n minus 1 versus 2n is going to be really useful. So again, this is a co-limit of SL2n mod SP2n. <clears throat> and these things, well, using two facts. Well, first of all, uh, if I look at SL2n minus 2 mod SP2n minus 2, and I include SL2n minus 2 into SL2n minus 1, and then use the isomorphism, that exceptional isomorphism I got before, I get some control over the fiber of stabilization. So this uh, fits into an exact sequence of groups where the next term, or the exact sequence of homogeneous spaces where the next term is SL2n minus 1 mod SL2n minus 2, which is a suitable sphere, and assuming I haven't made any indexing mistakes, which I can't guarantee, um, I get a description of the fiber as a motivic sphere because it's basically a punctured affine, it's the loops on a punctured affine space. And now borrowing a suspension from that 4n minus 1 sphere, uh, I get a cellular estimate for the loops there and that tells me uh, that I get the appropriate cellular estimate on SL, uh, on the fiber of the stabilization map as well. All right, any questions so far? So this is how these sort of cellular computations go. You have some nice geometric models from a space. You can usually sort of make some estimate and then you patch things together by cofiber and fiber sequences. All right, so another basic example, which requires a little bit more work, is that if I look at Vovodsky's motivic Allen-Merkin clean space, um, then this lies in uh, O of S 2NN. Um, this is at least in characteristic zero. Um, so this is basically follows from Vovetsky's symmetric power model, or the motivic dold tom theorem. <coughs> For the previous one. Here is a 10-6. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, I hope I got it right. There might be an off by one mistake. 
All right, so, so this is sort of an elementary uh, analysis of some of these cellular estimates. So let me do a little more complicated one. Uh, if I have a sufficiently nice motivic space, then I can do other things involving cellularity. So one of the things we do is build Postikov truncations, and uh, well, we can also take analogs of connective covers with respect to these SPQs, uh, and so we can build a functorial uh, SPQ cellular cover. And so, likewise, we can refine the Postikov tower uh, and the basic problem is that the Postikov layers need not preserve weak cellular classes, uh, but you can refine them to do so. And all of these things rely on uh, some technology which was developed by uh, Tom and, uh, and, and Mura. So if I want to take these, uh, so basically what I do is I start with the classical Postikov tower and Tom analog, analyzed analogs of these sort of notions of cellularity in, uh, in stable settings. And so the layers of the Postinkov tower are S1 infinite loop spaces. And so if we, we can analyze those stably, and uh, Tom observed that these, uh, these kinds of cellular covers can be viewed as truncations with respect to a T structure when I work stably. And so you can build up these Postnikov towers and their functoriality by basically looking at the classical Postnikov tower and then stably truncating it using Tom's T structures and then returning to the unstable situation. And if, so, so far I haven't made any mention of why the additional index is useful. I've only talked about connectivity, but probably the most amazing fact is that if Q is bigger than or equal to two, so in other words, if I'm sufficiently GM connected, then uh, not only are these layers S1 infinite loop spaces, but they are naturally P1 infinite loop spaces. So this relies on the motivic infinite loop space technology and uh, Tom and Mura and Tom's resolution of a conjecture of Fabian about when you can sort of GM D loop spaces. All right, so at the end of the day, if you start with a nice motivic space, we can break it up into pieces, which are at least with some additional assumptions on Q, P1 infinite loop spaces. And this will be important in a little bit. <coughs> All right, so I sort of mentioned it in passing, but we've already used motivic infinite loop space technology to do that kind of thing. And now I'd like to know that if I take loops, so this is improving the statement that I made about the James construction earlier, if I just start with a space that's an O of SPQ and I start taking loops of it, for example, simplicial loops or GM loops, uh, and I look at, or P1 loops, so omega 2, 1, then my expectation is that that's going to change cellular class in, a, in an expected fashion. Namely, it'll drop cellular class by exactly the, the numbers that are indicated by the corresponding looping. So that turns out to be true, uh, and this relies on Mark's analysis of the uh, homotopy Konevo tower. Uh, in particular in the GM direction case. All right, so there are a lot of things that have gone into this already. Um, and more generally, if I have a fiber of a map of reasonably cellular spaces, then I can also control, uh, I can give you some cellular estimate for the fiber. All right. Okay, so we have this notion of cellularity. It allows us to do many things. It allows us to break motivic spaces, at least under reasonable assumptions, into uh, simpler pieces, which are now stable, and we can try to analyze those pieces. And uh, I promised Mike I would state the Freudenthal theorem, so I finally can. It took me a while, but it's easy to, to state with these cellularity assumptions in place. Um, if I have a field that has characteristic zero, and I have a space that's in O of SPQ, and now I'm gonna impose some hypotheses. So I want the layers of the refined Postinkov tower to be P1 infinite loop spaces, so I'm gonna have Q bigger than or equal to two, and uh, I'm also gonna want some connectivity hypothesis. In particular, I'd like my space to be simply connected, so uh, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna assume that P minus Q is bigger than or equal to two. And now I can look at the fiber of the unit map for the P1 loops on the P1 suspension, and the way we'll state motivic Freudenthal is we'll give a weak cellular estimate for that fiber. So that's the weak cellular estimate. The fiber is in O of S A to Q, where A is this minimum of 2P minus 1 and P plus 2Q minus 1. 
So uh, I'll just observe that these numbers agree when p equals 2q. And if you're getting lost in the indices, let me do a simple case that is going to be useful for what I'm going to say later. So remember, I was interested in motivic spheres and A3 minus the origin. So I can look at the unit map for A3 minus the origin. And, oh man. You know, I plugged it in last night and it didn't charge. My kids decided they were going to remove it and plug in their devices. So. That's what happened. Um, so this fiber, if you sit down and compute these numbers, lies in O of S96. All right, so why is that useful? Well, we wanted to understand pi d of AD minus the origin for d large. And we're not quite getting that here. But for example, from this statement, you see that pi 3 of A3 minus the origin surjects onto pi 3 of 2, 1 loops of A4 minus the origin. All right. So this is almost pi 4 of A4 minus the origin, but it's pi 4 of the GM loops on A4 minus the origin. And as it turns out, that's actually sufficient to understand Morthy's conjecture. Uh, and in fact, this surjectivity statement is the only thing you need from Motivic Freudenthal to, 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 to get Morthy's conjecture in the beginning. And let me just observe, that is like the, the first interesting case of Freudenthal. So this is just like, this is not nearly using the full power of this theorem. All right. Okay, so let me just say a few words about the proof of this Motivic Freudenthal theorem. Um, so there's roughly sort of three steps. Um, so the first thing is we're going to reduce to the case of P1 infinite loop spaces uh, using this refinement of the Postikov tower that I mentioned earlier. We can under this assumption of Q is bigger than equal to two, build up a resolution of my space by P1 infinite loop spaces where the layers uh, have uh, cellularity which is controlled by the cellularity of the source. All right, so that already used a fair amount of technology. It already used motivic infinite loop space technology and uh, Mark's an analysis of the homotopy Konovo tower. Then I want to be able to get from uh, P1 infinite loop spaces to something a little bit simpler. So uh, using ideas of uh, Levine's slice convergence results uh, as sort of souped up by Tom and Eldon Almanto and Paul Arno Ostvar, um, you can devisage to the case of motives of smooth varieties. And once you've gotten to that case, you can sort of proceed by means of geometry. So we can treat the case of motives of smooth varieties by an explicit argument using the geometry of symmetric powers. And let me very quickly say how that bit of the argument goes. Um, so I'm interested in understanding KZ of N to N, and I can look at the unit map for P1 suspension. And one of the nice facts about this is that, well, KZ of N to N are fit together to become the motivic Allenberg and Klein spectrum. And if I look at the composite map, where I now look at the assembly map for the motivic Allenberg and Klein spectrum, I'm calling that AN, and I take its two one loops, then that composite map is just the identity. All right. So I observed earlier that there are nice results about fibers of composites, and so using those results, if I want a cellular estimate for the fiber of this composite map, well, that's the identity, so that's pretty high cellular class. Uh, When I 2, 1 loop kz of n plus 1, 2 n plus 1, I'm going to get back kz of n, 2 n. So there's a 2, 1 loops on the right-hand side. All right. So if I get a nice estimate for the cellular class of this uh, omega 2, 1 a n, or equivalently, by means of those looping results, if I get a nice estimate for the fiber or cofiber of the assembly map, um, then I can use that in conjunction with understanding cellularity, cell, cellularity of the identity map to deduce some statement about the unit map in the Freudenthal theorem. All right. So how do we analyze that assembly map? Well, as I said, it suffices to give you a cellular estimate for this cofiber. Uh, this is by means of some kind of uh, 
uh, homotopy excision type result for cellularity, which is part of the calculus of cellular classes. Uh, so you use the symmetric power model of uh, KZ of N to N in characteristic zero. And this map, if you unwind it, well, P1 smash N is a quotient of affine space by affine space minus the origin, if you want. And so uh, it ends up that you want to analyze the sigma R equivariant map, which goes from uh, A1 cross AN R times to AN cross AN R times, um, where the first map is basically this, the diagonal map from A1 into AN, and the second maps are just the inclusion of the factors. And so what you'll do is you'll take these affine spaces and you'll stratify them by means of the action of the symmetric group on R letters. And uh, when you do that stratification, you can build up the quotient by basically Tom complexes of nice equivariant vector bundles. And uh, you can iteratively analyze this, uh, this symmetric power. Uh, this idea goes back to Nakaoka and his study of the homology of the symmetric group, and Vovotsky wrote this down pretty explicitly in his analysis of the zero slice of the sphere spectrum in characteristic zero. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about the, the proof of Freudenthal, but you can see, since I've mentioned it, we've used like slice convergence results, which implicitly uses the Blockato conjecture. We've used uh, motivic infinite loop space technology of uh, Elmanto, uh, Oiwa, Kahn, Susnilo, and Jakerson. We've used uh, the homotopy Konovo tower. Um, so, I mean, we've used all of Fabian's results on, on ramifiedness of cohomology. And so this is what I think Mike meant when we said we throw everything at the subject, uh, everything that's known in the subject at this, at this proof. Um, it would be really nice to understand which of those things are really essential and which ones aren't. Um, so, I mean, for example, in positive characteristic, because of the use of the geometry of symmetric powers, we can only say something after inverting P. Um, and so uh, that's why I restricted my attention to characteristic zero to begin with. But um, I've been asked several times, you know, is there an easier proof I don't know. It's a challenge for the audience. Find an easier proof. All right. So let me go back to Murthy's conjecture. So I gave you, oh no. All right, looks like I'm on the board. Blame my kids. Uh, is there a big chalk here? No, it's a surface tablet. Can you someone is this still big enough? What is that? Let's see. Okay. Oh no, this is going to be problematic because uh, I only have one USB-C connector. Oh, I see. Let's try that. Let's see what happens. It's a surface tablet, so it's a... No. Oh, that worked. Slowly. All right, well, I'll start writing and then. No, it's not. It might not be strong enough. <clears throat> All right, so we had uh, SP2, which is S. 3, 2, and this went to 
the stable symplectic group, and we had uh, SL4 mod SP4, which was S53, and this goes to GL mod SP, and this GL mod SP space had the property that uh, its P1 loops were the stable symplectic group. So you can guess what's going to happen in general. Um, I'd like to get maps from motivic spheres that are odd to something involving uh, the spaces in bot periodicity for the orthogonal group. So I'll write this like this. So I take the geometric classifying space for the orthogonal group as in Bert's talks, and by means of Marco uh, and Girja's work, you have nice models for these kinds of de-loopings of these things. So for example, when n is equal to two, these de-loopings are exactly going to be the symplectic group, and when n is equal to three, I'm actually gonna get these GL mod SPs. When n is equal to zero, I'll get just the orthogonal group, and where are these maps coming from? So, <coughs> so this map was just some stabilization map. So it was literally given by some function involving taking a two by two symplectic matrix and embedding it in higher rank. And likewise here, so these things are actually given by morphisms of affine varieties. So I take this model of this as a hyperbolic quadric. And for each of the different kinds of objects that appears in this bot periodic space that comes from, uh, from the work of Girja and, uh, and Marco, there's an explicit morphism which is given by Suslin matrices. So in his proof of the n factorial theorem, Suslin introduced these matrices uh, which are, which stabilize to generators of uh, K-theory of these kinds of quadrics. Uh, so they end up being K1, generators of K1 uh, in this case. And these objects end up being corresponding generators when you stabilize. So if I de-loop this, uh, if I, sorry, if I loop both sides, if I loop 2n minus 1 and minus n times, uh, then I get a map that stabilizes to the unit map from uh, the sphere to z times bo, and uh, stably that's just the unit map for the, the spectrum ko. Let's see. I think it's right because if I loop, if I adjoint over, then I'll get S0 to Z times B at O. So I do want them to get the unit map in, in the stable situation. All right. Okay, so uh, Jean and I wrote down these, these, these maps in uh, sort of explicit matrices. They're given by some inductive procedure in general, but uh, you know, they're there. And so this source S2n minus 1n is 2n minus 1n cellular, and so I get a map from S2n minus 1n to the corresponding cellular cover of this space. Oh, yes, sorry, thank you. All right. So what did we see in the low dimensional cases? Well, we saw that the induced map from the first interesting case from pi two of this to this was surjective, and from pi three of this here is 
surjective. And it turns out that this map here is surjective after applying pi n. So that generalizes the, the fact that we saw for low values. Um, <coughs> and what we observed in these unstable situations was that the kernel of the map on pi n was covered by something, at least in the pi 3 case, that involved the motivic hop map. So the appropriate suspension of the motivic hop map uh, will give us a map from S2n plus 2n plus 2 to 2n minus 1n. And again, I hope my indices are correct. Plus two. Hopefully that's right. And maybe I'll state the theorem. So the other thing we get from Motivic Freudenthal, which is a slight improvement on what I said before, uh, just that was enough for Morthy's conjecture, is an actual computation of pi n of a n minus the origin. It surjects onto pi n of this. Let me call that star. And the kernel is something we can compute. And all those additional factors of i disappear. Those are all sort of unstable uh, artifacts. So this was So this should look familiar. This is a destabilization of the computation of Rondig, Spitz, Fek, and Ostvar. So they computed the stable motivic pi 1, and its description is exactly of this form. What does this become? This becomes the very effective cover of KO. Uh, this is sort of an unstable model of that. And so we know that there's a surjective map from pi n to the pi n of some very effective cover of KO, and the kernel is covered by k Milner n plus 2 mod 24. All right, now this may be not so great for Morthy's conjecture anymore because I have in some sense no idea what these sheaves actually look like once I've taken this cellular cover. I mean our hope is that this is sort of a more geometrically natural space. It's like some connective cover of, of, uh, of these zero spaces of Hermitian K theory. Maybe it has a nicer geometric description, but nevertheless, the fact that I know how to do these things for small values of n turns out to be sufficient. So even though I don't know precisely what these sheaves are, I know enough about them to compute the cohomology that arises in Worthy's conjecture. So let me just say that and I'll quit. Now you also see why I use slides, because, sorry, my handwriting's awful. Um, so what did we need to know? We needed to know hd of x with, sorry, hd plus 1 of x with coefficient in pi d of ad minus the origin. And there's some twist by the determinant there, which I'll ignore for the moment. And that group fits into an exact sequence where I have something involving Milner K3 mod 24 and this other thing. 
So let me talk about the Milner K theory mod 24 part first. So I want to compute this. It turns out the twist is essential here. There's several ways to describe this. Over any field, this can be identified with the 2D plus 3, uh, D plus 2 motivic cohomology of X with Z mod 24 coefficients. But by means of the Gerson resolution, this is a quotient of K Milner 1 of the residue field modulo 24. So in particular, if K is algebraically closed, this is something that's divisible. And so when I go mod 24, I just get 0. So this vanishes if K is algebraically closed. All right, so one part of the obstruction is necessarily always going to be 0. And the last thing is I want to compute hd plus 1 of x with coefficients in that complicated thing. I'm going to continue to call it star. Again, with some twist. So what do we know about it? Well, we know enough to know that its cohomology can be understood in terms of these Grothendieck-Witt sheaves. Again, there should be a twist here. And this turns out to be good enough because there's an exact sequence which describes this. So you can analyze the Gerson resolution for these Grothendieck-Witt sheaves in this dimension and you get a nice description involving cohomology operations. So let me write down the answer. Uh, this sheaf is H 2D plus 2, D plus 1. I didn't give myself enough space. With Z mod 2 coefficients, modulo the image of square 2 plus C1 of C from H 2D of x z mod 2. All right, so this is a theorem of Jean and myself that you have a description of this sheaf as something which, if you remember my last talk, looks so strikingly similar to the secondary obstruction in topology. There was an operation which was square 2, and then I cupped with w2, or, and so c1 maps to w2, and so this. This form of the obstruction is very, very similar to what happened in topology um, over time. But let me just observe that if x is affine and k is algebraically closed, then Reutemann's theorem tells me that this group is actually, uh, well, that the integral Chow group is actually divisible. So this mod 2 group is necessarily 0. So this group which houses the obstruction is also necessarily 0. And so this vanishes. So once we have this description of homotopy sheaves, which use some bit of Freudenthal, then we can just compute these cohomology by means of uh, Gersten resolutions and careful analysis of those things. And uh, we get some vanishing statement. And that vanishing statement is sufficient to finish the proof of Morty's conjecture. So let me quit there. Sorry for going over. Mm -hmm.